Now that we're done with our pulleys and belts, it's time to move to our quill or spindle assembly. You can see I've already got it fully extended and locked in place, and I also have this dial indicator in place. Uh, what I want to do right now is measure side to side and front to back deflection of this quill as I apply light pressure with my thumb. Uh, I have the dial indicator set up just because I love using dial indicators. You can just do this by hand usually, um, but I just like putting numbers to stuff. So I have this set up front to back right now, so I'm just going to grab the back of this quill and apply light pressure back and forth. And it looks like we got maybe two or three thousandths of an inch deflection, which is pretty respectable. Mostly we're looking for things that are, you know, five thousandths of an inch or more deflection. And similarly, I will set this up on the side here and then do the same thing. Looks like we've also got about four thousandths of an inch deflection side to side. Um, I'm not really too concerned about either one of those numbers, but I'll go ahead and show you how to make that adjustment if you need to, regardless. Now, if you wanted to reduce quill motion on this particular drill pest model, the first thing I would recommend is not to follow the instruction manual because it is wrong. It tells you to remove this hub assembly and adjust the screw inside, uh, but that's inaccurate. I will demonstrate that in a minute when I adjust the uh, spring tension. What you actually need to adjust is this set screw here. It is a keyed set screw that rides along this channel on the quill housing. Uh, the problem is that this also doesn't actually do much of anything, and I'll demonstrate that here real quick. So you just loosen this nut here, and then I will adjust it as far as I can one direction and then the, and then the other, and we'll see if there's any change in quill motion. So it has about this much adjustability. I'll tighten it as far down as I can. And we've got about the same amount of deflection. Now I'll loosen it as much as I can. And there's basically no change in the amount of motion. So the thing is, this set screw doesn't actually touch the inside of this channel. You can see the grease here hasn't really been disturbed. Um, where it was previously set. So this really doesn't do much of anything because it doesn't actually press up against the cool housing and it it also can't be removed because it's a captured screw. So once again this is ineffective in reducing quill motion. The way that I've seen people deal with quill motion on these particular drill presses or ones like them are to actually use a metal cutting bandsaw to cut a slit in the front of this housing similar to this and in insert a through bolt so that it creates a captured um, housing, kind of like a lot of vintage drill presses used to have. So the addition of that through bolt and the split housing will allow you to essentially tighten down around the quill and reduce some of the slop in there. But good luck if you decide to go down that path. I'm not going to demonstrate that here. So while we're over here, I'll go ahead and show you how to adjust spring tension. First of all, we'll go ahead and remove this. As well as our dial indicator. So when I'm talking about spring tension, basically I'm trying to adjust how fast this retracts. And as you can see, mine goes kind of quickly. So I'll try and make an adjustment to slow it down just a little bit. The first thing we want to do is remove this cap here on the hub assembly. Oops, push it right back in again. There we go. And we're going to remove this outer nut here. Making sure not to lose the washers and remove this hub assembly. So this reveals this cushion and another washer. We'll go ahead and pull those out of there, save them for later. Removing that hub assembly reveals a locking nut, an inner nut, this cap for the torsion mechanism, uh, which I'll demonstrate in a minute, and this screw here, which is essentially a through bolt for the uh, feed assembly. And this is what the instruction manual wanted you to adjust. But we'll go ahead and loosen this locking nut, and I'll demonstrate real quick why that's wrong. Now, if I take a screwdriver and adjust this screw like it tells you to, 
you can see it's just connected to the feed assembly on the other side and it doesn't do anything for quill motion. So that's why I said that was wrong earlier. So with the locking nut loosened, I can now loosen my inner nut here. And what I'll want to do is pull my cap away from the housing enough so that it's not captured here anymore. And you can see periodically it has these cutouts in the cap. And what we'll, what we'll do is pull the cap away, rotate it until it's captured on the next one. This essentially adjusts the spring tension. So if you go counterclockwise, it's going to increase spring tension. If you go clockwise, it'll uh, reduce spring tension. And since mine's a little bit fast, I'll remind you what it looks like here. And I want to reduce it, I'm going to go clockwise. Now the problem is that this spring is going to get caught here. So I actually need to pull it far enough away that it goes two grooves. Um, but I want to make sure that the spring doesn't completely unwind, so I can't allow this plate right here to come out of the cap. Now for this step, I recommend you put a pair of gloves on just in case the spring gets away from you and twist in your hand, you don't tear your hand up. So I need to move this inner spring far enough away. A little dicey there for a second, but there we go. Now my spring tension should be reduced. There we go. Unfortunately, I had to return my cap to its original position because in the lower position, the torsion in the spring wasn't enough to fully retract the spindle, which is a problem. Now the last thing we need to do is to adjust this inner nut position so that it allows for full spindle motion and full retraction. And I'll demonstrate why that's a balancing act real quick. So right now uh, my inner nut is still pretty loose and my cap can move freely and our spindle will have full motion, normal motion. So if instead I tighten this inner nut down too much, the spindle motion will actually be stopped or significantly restricted. So it's a little bit of a balancing act. Now the way that I adjust my final inner nut position is based on the small stroke at the beginning where there's the least amount of tension. Essentially I'll keep tightening this down until my spindle motion or my spindle doesn't fully retract anymore and then back off a little bit. So this is my final inner nut position. You can see we get full retraction at the beginning and smooth motion over the entirety of the stroke. It's still a tad fast for my taste, but like I mentioned, I can't adjust my cap to this one uh, position that conflicts with the, the bracket. So the only thing left is to go ahead and reinstall the hub assembly. Okay, now that we're done with our spindle and uh, quill tube adjustments, or lack thereof, we're ready to move on to runout checks. Uh, runout checks are typically what people associate with, uh, you know, tuning up a drill press, even though they're only one of many. Um, but essentially what we want to check for is for non-concentric rotation of our drill bit that can negatively affect uh, the holes that we create. Uh, so for this, I highly recommend having a dial indicator, obviously. Um, it's going to be very hard for you to check this if you don't have this. Now you don't necessarily have to have a magnetic base, but it certainly doesn't hurt. Now when I do run out checks, I usually like to do it with the full assembly together, and if I see any issues, then I'll work my way up. Now I can already tell that this chuck and arbor probably have an issue, because you'll notice my table's damaged here. After making the speed adjustments with my belts, the whole arbor and chuck fell out twice. So I'm guessing there's some issue uh, up there. But be that as it may, I want to start with the full assembly together because many of these are just interference fits and sometimes they can come together to improve overall runout or make it worse. And so I don't want to change anything if there's not a problem. And so what I'm shooting for is about less than five thousandths run out. Now when you do your run out checks at the, the chuck jaws, what you want is a bit inserted into the end that is precision ground in order to minimize the amount of error associated with the non-concentricity of the bit itself. Um, so that all the run out is associated with the drill press. So what I like to use is just a half inch router bit. Here I just pulled a random uh, dovetail bit. And I'll also double check that with a half inch drill bit, just to make sure there's no error 
in the router bit itself. So I'll just go ahead and put that in there. So as you can see, my router bit is installed and my dial indicator is zero to top dead center, which I found by moving my table back and forth until it was at its maximum value. Now I'm going to use the center pulley to rotate through uh, 360 degrees on the router bit and we're going to see how much deflection we get total. Looks like we're up at about five and back down to zero, negative one, negative one and a half, negative two or three. Kind of jumped there for a second. So it looks like we have a run out of maybe up to about nine or so. I'm going to go ahead and recheck this with the drill bit just to make sure it's not an issue with the router bit. Now, because the amount of runout that I measured at the tip uh, of the jaws here is more than desirable, uh, it's about nine thousandths of an inch compared to my target of about five, what I want to do is remove the chuck from the arbor and test the arbor separately to see if I can narrow down the source of the runout. So what I'm going to use is this wedge piece of metal to uh, dislodge the chuck, or the, the arbor I should say. There we go. Didn't even need my mallet. Uh, as you can see, the arbor has some rust on it, which isn't really desirable. That could be why it fell out earlier and it's not mating very well. Now the next thing we need to do is knock the arbor out of the chuck so we can reinstall it separately. Uh, I'm just going to use a simple punch here and see if I can't just knock it out very easily. There we go. So that's the chuck by itself. You can see there's a little bit of dirt in there, which we'll need to clean out a little bit later. And then the arbor itself looks like it's, it's seen better days. It's a little bit rusted. It's got some grime up here. So my suspicion is that the arbor is actually at fault for the run out, but we'll go ahead and check that. Let's take a quick peek inside the quill here to see if there's any damage in here. You can see that's also pretty dirty up in there. Yeah, you can see that's pretty bad, actually. It's pretty unfortunate. Yeah, I'm gonna need to clean that out. So I'm just gonna clean both the arbor both the arbor adapter and wow you can see how much that cleaned up just from a little bit of a uh, solvent wow that made a huge difference now we'll also clean up in the quill And I'm just going to use my punch here on a lint-free lint -free cloth. Let's see if we can't clean that out a little bit in there. Wow, you can see how dirty that is. I've actually never cleaned this. I bought it used from the previous owner, so my guess is it's been like that for quite a while. All right, so I cleaned the inside of the quill and also the arbor adapter and uh, it looks the arbor adapter actually looks much better but it does appear to have only been captured about right here so that may be why it fell out earlier um, you can see how much dirt was in there um, from these rags it's a pretty significant amount let me go ahead and show you the inside of the the quill real quick Well, it's also looking a lot better. So let's go ahead and install the Arbor adapter. Um, it only goes one of two ways, either this way or 180 degrees. So we'll go ahead and just install it one way. Check the run out, and if we need to, we'll install it the other way. 
That's really all it takes. All right, so my arbor adapter is reinstalled. I have my dial indicator zeroed at top dead center again. And we're going to go ahead and rotate through the center pulley once more. So it goes to about negative half a thousandth and then up to positive half a thousandth or so, maybe up to one. So we have between one and two thousandths of an inch to uh, run out on the Arbor adapter, which is pretty good actually. Uh, I don't see an issue with that. So we're gonna go ahead and clean the chuck out, put the chuck back in and see if uh, the run out improved with cleaning this adapter at all. All right, so I've also cleaned my chuck out. Hopefully that comes out on camera, but it is also much cleaner. So we're gonna go ahead and reinstall that, making sure the jaws are retracted. So my router bit is reinstalled. I'm gonna rotate through uh, the motor pulley, one full rotation and see how much run out we have. from about nine thousandths of an inch to half a thousandth right now. So I am perfectly happy with this amount of run out. If you were so inclined, you could try different uh, orientations of the chuck to see whether you can get it to mate a little bit better with the Arbor adapter in such a way that the run outs sort of uh, cancel each other out a little bit. Similarly, you can try flipping the Arbor adapter 180 degrees and reinstalling it as well um, if you're getting Arbor run out. But in my case, I am happy with these results, so I'm going to go ahead and leave it as is and move on to the next step.